Today's topic, WIC trains. In this episode of the Geotechnical Engineering Podcast, I'll be talking with Martin Marty Talby, PEPG. He's the Vice President of Business Development at Menard USA. And we're gonna be talking about WIC trains, what they are, how do they work, and what are some of the challenges associated with installing WIC trains. It's not easy for us busy geotechnical engineers to keep up with industry trends while keeping up with our engineering work. Therefore, it's our goal of the Geotechnical Engineering Podcast to help you do just that. We strive to keep our listeners informed on important industry topics and also to educate you on interesting technical topics and trends in the geotechnical world. I'm your host, Jared Green, and I'm excited to be bringing you another episode of the Geotechnical Engineering Podcast. And with that, let's jump right into today's episode. This video is brought to you by Menard USA. Menard USA is a specialty ground improvement contractor that works nationally providing design-build ground improvement solutions at sites with problematic soils. Menard works closely with civil, structural, and geotechnical engineers to minimize foundation costs for wide ranges of soil conditions, structure types, and loading conditions. To learn more about Menard USA or for help on your next project, please visit www.menardusa.com. Welcome to the show, Marty. How are you doing? I'm doing great today. How about yourself, Jared? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. I'm excited about this conversation. Um, when I saw you on the list for the schedule, I saw this should be great. This should be great. <laughs> well, I appreciate that because I've really been enjoying your podcast. So oh. I'm, uh, I'm honored and happy to be here. Thanks. All right. Great, great, great. Well, let's get right into our conversation. It'd be great if you could tell our listeners a little bit more about yourself, Marty, and um, what is it that you do on a daily basis? Sure. So my background is I'm a geotechnical engineer, and I work with Menard USA, who is a specialty ground improvement contractor. We're based out of Pittsburgh, but we have offices nationally, and we're part of a large uh, international group. And my role is business development. So as vice president of business development, I get involved with special initiatives. Um, I follow certain key national accounts. Um, the way that we're structured, we have a number of different regional offices. The regional offices tend to do, or they all do uh, their own business development in their region but I help to coordinate and support those activities across the company. And I also look after our marketing and communications uh, for, for the company. Uh, I get involved with uh, you know, writing and presenting technical papers. I attend conferences. I do you know, lunch and learn presentations. Um, and on the WIC train side, and the reason why I'm talking about WIC trains and interested in them is that when I came to Menard in 2004, uh, at that point, I uh, was put in a role of bidding and managing WIC train projects. And mm -hmm. ultimately, I uh, developed to the point where I was uh, managing our WIC train division. So I'm still involved uh, in WIC train projects because I'll still review some of the larger or more challenging WIC train projects, or when there's technical issues or questions about WIC trains, I'll, I'll get brought in. So, um, you know, my position, it's a really nice mix of being involved with uh, operational activities, but also business development. So there's the creative part of that associated with marketing. So it's a lot of fun, but still, you know, get to be involved with projects. So it's really, really nice mix for me i feel you know very fortunate oh that's awesome that's awesome i'm curious with the business development is that something that you know you kind of sought out or was this an opportunity that was presented in front of you and you said yes because it's geotex i don't think we have a class on business development <laughs> yeah we don't and uh, many of us uh, geotechnical engineers uh, in particular myself we're not uh, inherently or naturally business development people. Yeah. Uh, and so it's something, again, it didn't come natural, but I really enjoy it. I enjoy the business development uh, aspect of, of what I do and, and of our work. 
Um, and you had asked, you know, how I got into that. Actually, I was doing business development in another company, actually one of our sister companies, Nicholson Construction, mm -hmm. uh, prior to working at Menard. Uh, ultimately, I came to Menard, as I mentioned, in, in 2004, and I was uh, brought over to do business development. There was actually a need for someone to get involved with WIC train. So I was hired to do business development, but actually uh, became involved with the WIC train business. And I'm, I'm very fortunate and grateful that I had that opportunity to get involved with WIC trains. Okay, great. Well, thank you for that. Thank you for that. And you mentioned WIC trains, and that's really what our focus is going to be for this episode. Um, you know, in your own words, and again, for, for context, we have people that are listening in that are still in school, right? Undergraduate students, grad students, PhD students. Uh, we have folks that have been in the industry. We have folks that are on the edges of geotechnical engineering, like structural engineering. Yeah. And we have people that have no idea about engineering at all that are just curious to, that listen in or, or watch. But in your own words, what can you tell us about what WIC trains are and how do they work? Sure. So um, I guess yeah, so I'll, I'll keep the description fairly basic if I can. But you know, in, in basic terms, um, there are some soils that when you place fill upon them, they experience issues because there's poor pressure building up in those soils. So in particular, this would be slow draining fine grain soil. So typically clayey soils that when you start placing fill on top of them, uh, when they're saturated, uh, it takes a long time for the poor pressures to dissipate. Now you could place that same fill on top of a sandy or granular soil and the poor pressures dissipate almost immediately. So with granular soils, the settlement is uh, more immediate, but with clay soils, the settlement takes a long time. And that's called consolidation settlement, right? And consolidation settlement can take years or even decades to occur. And sometimes uh, preloads or surcharges are used to prepare a site. So if you have a site with a saturated clay soil, you might bring in a pile of soil and let it sit until the settlement is kind of taken out of the clay. And again, that can take a long time because you know clays are very low permeability and it takes a long time for the water particles to flow through the clay. And so wick drains are installed in order to shorten the drainage pathway and to help speed up that consolidation process. So wick drains are just thin uh, plastic prefabricated drains. They're typically four inches uh, wide by an eighth of an inch thick. They're typically comprised of a plastic core that has you know, typically either channels or fins in it, and it's wrapped or encased or bounded by a geotextile fabric which acts as a filter to prevent funds from migrating into the drain. And we mobilize either cranes or more typically large excavators with a mast. And that mast has a hollow tube or what we call a mandrel. We, um, we would insert the wick drain material into the mandrel and push the mandrel into the ground, retract the mandrel, leaving the wick drain in the ground. And so we're, we're typically installing wick trains, I'd say on average between you know, three feet to eight foot on a center to center spacing. On most projects, we install them in a triangular grid pattern. And wick trains are, are best you know, used in association with a preload or surcharge, again, where you're placing fill or piling up soil. Uh, they're used a lot for land reclamation projects. And then uh, sometimes they're used under earthen structures like dams and, and levees where you're, you know, that's what the project entails is just placing fill. And if that fill is being placed on soft ground, then in many cases, wick drains would be used to expedite the consolidation settlement. Um, wick drains are also in addition to speeding up the settlement, they help the soils gain strength as they're consolidating. 
So there are some corollary benefits of enhancing stability under slopes and embankments when wick drains are used. Very nice. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Sure. And you know, talk a little bit about the wick drain design. Yeah, you know, how sure. is it designed, and and who's typically responsible for doing that design? Sure. So um, there, you know, the wick drain design. It's it's typically you know uh, typically based on selecting the right design, but you're also looking at a preload or surcharge height. You know, so you can do a few. You can do a couple different things to speed up the consolidation settlement. So one of those things would be to tighten up the spacing, but you could also increase the fill height, so the height of the preload or surcharge. So typically the design is also uh, accounting for or, or looking at the schedule and the economics of the, of the project because you know, it costs money to place fill, it costs money to install wick trains. So you're looking at that right mix of what's the preload or, or surcharge height and what's the right spacing. So it's kind of a, an iterative process where you're looking at, uh, at some different factors. Um, and, and the wick trains are, one thing that makes them you know, somewhat unique is that uh, as opposed to most of the other ground improvement technique, wick trains are, are used to speed up settlement. And if you think about all of the other ground improvement techniques, wick trains are typically used to mitigate settlement, right? Mm -hmm. So wick, or, or excuse me, the other techniques are used to mitigate settlement. So uh, that makes that's a little bit unique and different about wick trains. Then another thing that's different is that Wick trains are typically best designed by the project's engineer as opposed to the installer. Most of the other techniques lend themselves nicely to design build approaches where the installing contractor is providing the design for that technique. But there's a lot of variables associated with wick trains. Um, the, the, uh, the soil properties that are necessary to predict settlement and consolidation time are very difficult to nail down. So specifically, <laughs> that would be the C sub H, um, which is typically indirectly derived or estimated from the C sub V. So you have some difficulties in just defining the parameters. And then there's other variables that are outside of the, the scope or control of the WIC train installer, such as how quickly the fill is going to be placed, you know, working elevations, uh, unit weight of fill. Um, and with WIC train programs, you know, we always recommend that, yes, you've installed WIC trains, but you still want to monitor the pore pressure and settlement. And that's really how you determine uh, when to remove when to remove the preload or when to remove the surcharge or when you can put your structure in place, when you can top the road off on that embankment by monitoring the settlement, making sure that that's you know, basically stabilized and settled out and also making sure uh, by using piezometers and monitoring pore pressures that the pore pressures have, di have dissipated. Okay, great. And, and how long have wick trains been used in the US? Well, um, prior to, you know, say the 1970s, and actually going back to about the 20s, sand drains were the predominant technique for expediting consolidation settlement. They were used commonly under embankments for, you know, highway jobs. Um, but there are some uh, issues with, with sand drains in terms of the cost, the amount of uh, sediment that was generated in the installation process. And really WIC trains, you know, starting uh, in the 70s with the development of geosynthetics and the development of you know, the WIC train in its current form, which is a plastic core encased or wrapped with uh, geotextile fabric, that really came into prominence in the, in the United States in the late 70s and, and 80s. So, Wick train in their current form were, were installed again, late 70s, early 80s, and really by the probably mid 80s in the United States, wick trains had all but uh, replaced sand drains. Mm -hmm. and, and with the drains, I mean, you're, you're providing a, a drainage pathway, right? So 
sometimes you're bringing water to the surface. So you have a gravel layer up top or, you know, what, what type of things are you doing to control water up top once it gets there? Sure. So with, uh, with wick drains, you're exactly right. You're typically bringing water up to the surface, although the amount of water can vary. Sometimes you don't get water at the surface. If you happen to extend the wick trains into an underlying granular or layer, mm -hmm. uh, so below the con consolidating layer, or if there are intermittent uh, sandy or granular layers, or what we see a lot of is uh, overlying fill. So at the surface, you might have a granular or more open soil, and the water might not make it to the surface. But when it does, you're right, you do need a, a way of receiving that water. And the most common way is a, a drainage blanket, which would be typically sand, or sometimes we see an open stone layer that's installed. And that layer is very helpful to us as installers, because not only does it receive the water, but that uh, provides a good working platform for us. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. And in urban area, I mean, I've had some, you know, earthwork projects that are in urban areas and the fill is, feels kind of hard to get through. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, have you had projects where you had to pre-drill before lowering the mandrel? Yeah, too many of them because yeah. that's always the uh, <laughs> most difficult part. And that's the most expensive part of installing wick trains is if you have to pre-drill. Because yeah. the cost of pre-drilling is much more than the cost of uh, installing wicks. Yeah. So you hit it right on the head. Yeah, that is a common issue. Um, we do pre-drilling for a couple of different reasons, Jared. Um, mm -hmm. One would be like the situation that you cited, which is where you have an overlying rubble or fill or just otherwise dense layer. Mm -hmm. Sometimes there's naturally dense or very stiff layers at the surface, but we also see, you know, uh, especially in the Northeast and Midwest, a lot of sites with uh, urban fill, right? Mm. So we have to get through those layers. And wick drains were developed in order to treat soft soil. So we're exactly. using a long, <laughs> skinny mandrel to push wick drains into the ground. Mm -hmm. And so they don't uh, do well when you have, uh, you know, a stiffer or, or, or dense or obstructed layer. So you're right. We do have to fairly commonly um, pre-drill to facilitate the insertion of the mandrel. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, we, we've seen, and probably more recently, Jared, we're, we're seeing projects where it's a very stiff profile, like the entire soil profile is pretty stiff. Mm. And we actually have to pre-drill that entire length. Wow. We've done projects where we have to pre-drill you know, 50 feet to install a 50 foot drain. <laughs> and when you're pre-drilling that deep, um, that really ma makes me ask a couple questions, which would yeah. be, <laughs> If you have to work that hard to, to install the drain, do you really need you it? You need the drain, right? So right? <laughs> do you need wick drains? And do you need anything? Do you need any type of ground improvement? And if so, are wick drains the right technique? It just might not be the, the right technique if, if you're having to pre-drill uh, full length. But we do have to do it from, from time to time. Okay. Okay. Uh, you kind of touched on this a little bit before, but just to, you know, I think it, it's helpful to just ask the question, you know, what types of soils are wick trains installed in and what type of structures are they installed for? Sure thing. Um, so it's, it's, as I mentioned, Jared, it's fine grain, slow draining soil. So mm -hmm. that's primarily going to be clays, but sometimes silts or, you know, very commonly silty clays. Uh, and then also sludges or tailings. That's another kind of common application for, for wick trains. Uh, fine grain, you know, dredged materials that are, that are slow draining. So in general, it's just slow draining uh, soils would be the, you know, the, the general type of soil that wick trains are installed in. And then in terms of the type of structures, you know, wick trains are have a long history of use in transportation projects. Mm -hmm. So that would be, you know, mainly highway embankments, particularly when the embankments are being built on soft compressible ground, right? Mm -hmm. So, and that would uh, mitigate long-term uh, settlement issues for those roadways and also help with the stability um, during the construction of the embankment. So transportation structures, uh, we use wick trains a lot 
in conjunction with preloads for storage tanks. We do that a lot in the Gulf Coast. Mm -hmm. So it's very common where you have like large, uh, very open storage terminals and very soft ground that before the tank is constructed, you know, a sand blanket is placed, we install the wick drains, and then a soil preload is brought in to basically sit on site for anywhere from 45 to 90 days on average. And during that time, the soils are consolidating. Once you get the desired settlement out of the soils, you remove the preload and you build your tank. And the idea is that that ground has already seen the, the simulated stresses, you know, that it's going to see during the service of the tank. It saw that in the form of the soil preload, yep. right? So transportation structures like embankments, tanks, very commonly used for um, land reclamation projects. So large port projects where they're filling in slips or otherwise, you know, uh, placing fill on soft uh, bay materials. Mm -hmm. So both the, the dredged materials or the pumped in material, both those and the underlying soft bay materials need to be treated. So it's another very common application for wick trains. And then also, you know, general buildings and structures, we still do projects where, you know, wick trains are used to speed up the the settlement for a preload for a you know one or two story structure mm -hmm. so wick trains would not be used for high rises certainly and even <laughs> i'd say mid rises you know in terms of buildings yeah we'll we'll do wick trains for you know buildings that are maybe one two or maybe three stories max but beyond that the loads are getting too heavy and it's uh, a wick train and preload program wouldn't be practical you know, at, at that point. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And I have to imagine for those dredging sites and rec, you know, land reclamation projects, you, you have the additional challenge of, you know, you might need a working platform just to get your equipment in to install the wick trains. And then it's like, you know, do I have to pre-drill through the working platform? I said, it's a, it, it's a bit of a dance you have to do here, right? To get yeah, it yeah, it is. <laughs> Fortunately, with the wick trains, you know, what we've seen is that in most cases, a sand blanket um, That's enough for you? Is, is enough for us. Okay. And it's good because, yeah, that works out well with the incorporation of that drainage blanket into the project. Um, so usually like a you know, 12 to 18 inch sand blanket is good. Now, with very soft soils, we might need to place some, have some geotextile fabric placed first mm -hmm. before that sand or maybe even geogrid. But uh, usually the sand is fine. Uh, in extreme conditions, we might need grid and then a layer of stone and then sand on top or just work off of that stone. But uh, as long as that working platform isn't more than, say, three feet thick, mm -hmm. if it was, you know, let's say it was four or five feet thick and compacted stone, then we'd need to pre-drill. But um, <laughs> You know, in terms of being able to penetrate without pre-drilling, I would say in most cases if the working platform, as long as it's not, you know, too coarse, if it's, you know, less than three feet, we're typically fine. But it's definitely a consideration. It's definitely important to have those discussions with the installer, right? And, um, you know, as, a, as an engineer or a specifier, you know, that's, the working platform is is a huge consideration, not just for wick trains, but really for any ground improvement or deep foundation mm -hmm. system. It's something that should be considered. And you, you hit it right on the head. You don't want to put something in place that creates more work, right? Mm -hmm. It's a balancing act. You want a good platform, but does that platform need to be uh, drilled through? And we've ha we've ha have had some projects where lime treatment or mm. shallow soil mixing has been done to the point that the soils are the upper soils are very stiff and we'd have to come through and pre-drill. So it does happen for sure. Okay. Thanks for that, Marty. And, um, you know, there, so there's going to be some sites where, you know, you're looking to do ground improvement. Clay is soft. All of a sudden, wick trains aren't appropriate. If wick trains aren't appropriate, what are some of the ground improvement techniques you're, you're considering? We've talked about this on the show with, with others. And actually, sure. some of your colleagues as well. So, what are, what are some of the some of the things in your bag of tricks there? Sure. So, you know, keeping in mind that wicks are used for typically treating soft clays. So, talking about soft and compressible clays, 
I'll narrow it down to very soft clays because those are the most uh, pro problematic. Mm -hmm. So for very soft clays, if wicks aren't appropriate, then you know at Menard we would typically look first to the you know CMC rigid inclusion. Um, and the reason I say original inclusion as opposed to some other techniques like perhaps stone columns or aggregate piers is that for soft clays, there are issues with um, confinement or maybe I'll say lack of confinement. So in soft clays, they can be problematic for stone columns or aggregate systems because those types of systems rely on the confinement of the surrounding soils. So if you have a very soft uh, soft zone, right, when you go to load the, the stone column, it can tend to bulge, right, and spread. And that's where you get settlement or, or worse, you know, possibly a rupture of the column. So if, if wicks aren't appropriate for a soft clay site or very soft clay site, I, I'd say we'd first look at uh, rigid inclusions. And rigid inclusions, I, I know you've talked about them on other uh, podcasts, but they're grouted elements. So mm -hmm. basically, you know, we would drill down into the ground and we install an element that's typically between 12 and 18 inches and it's grouted. So it sets up to be very stiff. So you don't have the same issues with confinement that you would have, you know, with stone or aggregate systems. And uh, they do really well spanning across or, or reinforcing, you know, soft clays, uh, organic silts, other organic soils. Okay. And what do you think are some of the biggest challenges if you, when you're installing wick trains? And you hit on some of these, but what do you think are some of the biggest challenges? Yeah, so one would be the penetrability. So when we receive a, a, a set of borings uh, to, to review for either a bid or you know, while we're doing consultation, we look at you know, the blow counts or if there's strength tests or perhaps CPTs, whatever form that information is, you know, is in. The first thing we're looking at is how stiff are these soils and are we going to be able to penetrate with the mandrel? Okay. Because, and I'll, I'll keep this in terms of SPT and values. Mm -hmm. Once you get, you know, above 10 or certainly 15 blows per, per foot, when you get into, you know, much stiffer soils, it is very difficult to penetrate. And so, mm -hmm. you know, at that point, you might be looking at pre-drilling or other means of assisting the mandrel to, to, to penetrate. Uh, so yeah, number one challenge would be penetrability uh, of, of the soils, and that's typically based on how stiff they are, right? Um, there's a couple other uh, issues that we would face as installers. One would be, can we get the wick trains to, to anchor? So mm -hmm. we install wicks by you know, pushing down the steel tube or mandrel into the ground. And when we get down to our target depth, we start retracting the mandrel. Now at the bottom of the mandrel and at the bottom of the wick, we loop the wick train through a, an anchor plate or through an anchor rebar, right? And so as we pull the anchor up, or excuse me, as we pull the mandrel up, that anchor needs to grab onto the surrounding soils. And that's what keeps the wick train in place. Mm -hmm. So if the um, if the soils are too soft in the anchoring zone, then we won't be able to anchor. We won't be able to grab onto those soils, and we'll just pull the wick train up as we're pulling the mandrel out of the ground. Mm -hmm. So anchoring would be a second issue, and then the third issue, also related to anchoring, but it gives us problems for another reason, would be artesian pressures. Mm -hmm. So if we hit an artesian uh, layer and that's where you have basically confined pressures and when you breach the layer you would have a upflow of water at a high velocity right so artesian pressures sometimes you see that water coming up at the surface and that's problematic for wick trains uh, not just for the installation but uh, you may never get the wick trains to to shut off if you penetrate a, an artesian layer wow for that second one, I mean, what is what do you do for that? If if you have an issue with the anchoring, I mean, what what, what can be done? There's a, a couple of tricks to the trade. Uh, the first thing we would look at is using a larger anchor. So, the the typical um, anchor is just a small, flexible, uh, basically sheet metal plate mm -hmm. um, that kind of crimps around the the mandrel and forms a cup. But we can look at larger anchors, like we've incorporated form ties. So 
steel ties that would reach out and grab the soil. Mm. So we've incorporated that. We've tried using multiple anchor plates mm -hmm. uh, when we have trouble with uh, anchoring. And then another thing that we can do is keep the mandrel full of water. So to provide a head, so that helps prevent sense, yeah. the migration of mud up into the mandrel. So there's a few things that we can do, but um, they all add time and cost to the installation process. Makes sense. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. And are there any safety, you know, safety concerns from working with foot trains that need to be kind of sure? And, and as always, you know, safety <laughs> is of utmost importance. So that's probably the most important question that you've asked, although <laughs> they've all been very good and interesting questions. Nice. Uh, so from a safety point of view, I wouldn't necessarily say that, you know, any of these issues are unique, let's say, to WIC trains, but you know, a few things that come to mind would be. Uh, you know, hey, we're in, we're working with a very tall mast. So typically, the mast height is about ten feet taller than the depth of the wick train. Mm -hmm. And we do wick trains, you know, to depths of well over a hundred feet. We've done them to depths of one hundred sixty feet or so. And so, when you have a mast that high, that that means a couple of things. You know, one is you need to be very careful with overhead utilities. You know, high power lines, any sort of lines that are uh, above head right mm -hmm. and then the second thing would be we need a large machine to support that equipment so it's going to be a large heavy tracked excavator typically uh and we're working typically at sites with soft soil and you yeah. had brought up working platforms before and working platforms are, are an issue certainly with you know not just wick drains and not just ground improvement, but also, you know, most of the deep foundation techniques as well. So, you know, uh, that's certainly an issue for us as well in slowing wicks would be the working platform. And then uh, anytime we're penetrating the ground with wick trains or any other deep foundation or ground improvement technique, uh, buried utilities would also mm. be a concern. Um, you know, and, and about um, working platforms, you know, I'm just really pleased to see that um, there's been some really great developments in the United States through DFI and other cooperating organizations uh, with respect to working platforms. There's been some great guidance that's been developed. There's a lot more information available now, and I would encourage the listener to um, reach out, get involved with those uh, organizations, but at a minimum, you know, track down the information that's available for working platforms because it's really a a, a, a problem that uh, has not gone away. We're working yeah. to address it in the industry and uh, we're making good strides. We still have some, some work to do, but, uh, you know, at a minimum at this point, there's some good uh, guidance and documentation uh, available in the industry. So I'd encourage uh, folks to, you know, to get a hold of that information and educate themselves with respect to working platforms. Thank you. Yeah, it's just uh, very important. Very important. Very important. Well, before we take our break, I would love it if you could share your final piece of advice that you're giving to engineers. And again, some of the listeners are the ones that are specifying WIC drains. So what, what is sure. it they should be thinking about? Sure. And some of this advice, you know, might carry other carry over to other techniques, you know, not just ground improvement, but uh, any any construction technique. Um, mm -hmm. But I would say for the you know, for the specifications, you know, um, I would do my due diligence to make sure that what you're specifying is uh, practical. Right. Not just that it can be put down in the specifications and shown on plans, but it's it's buildable and it's practical and that it's uh, a good cost effective approach, right? And so I would encourage people to reach out to specialty contractors. So that could be whether it's for wick trains or for piling, you know, talk to your piling contractor, your ground improvement contractors, you know, to get specialty contractor involvement um, and I think that can really benefit and can really help you kind of walk through the project, make sure that what you're putting in the plans and specifications is, is practical. And you know, if you get the contractor involved early enough, you know, they might come up with an alternate or other solution that uh, 
might make a lot of sense for the for the project. So, and I know at, at uh, Menard, you know, we're always happy to take calls from engineers to discuss feasibility, to look at um, you know how practical a solution is, to offer budgetary pricing. Um, so we're happy to do it, as I'm sure others are. And uh, I would su suggest you know. Uh, that that taking the time, taking the effort to reach out and get a specialty contractor involved, that would be the advice for those uh, specifying wick trains and other techniques. All right, great. Well, we're gonna come back in just a minute and close this one out with Marty in our career factor safety end segment. Stick around. This video is also brought to you by PPI, a leader in engineering exam prep for the FE and PE exams. PPI provides expert prep courses and study resources designed to help you pass the FE and PE exams the first time. PPI's live online courses include hours of lectures, problem solving demonstrations, exam strategy sessions, office hours, and a passing guarantee. Check out PPI today at ppi2pass.com to see all the options available for FE and PE exam prep. It's time for our career factor safety end segment. So welcome back. And in geotechnical engineering, just like many disciplines of engineering, it's important to incorporate a factor safety into your design. But what about incorporating a factor safety into your career? Today, of course, we're speaking with Martin Taubi, Vice President of Business Development at Menard USA. Marty, you've already had a very successful career. And when you look back on your career, what's one thing you implemented into your career to give yourself, let's call it a factor of safety in your career? Sure, thanks. And you know, certainly in my career, I've been really fortunate to have worked at you know, some great organizations. And I've been, you know, I'd say more fortunate to have had some really great mentors, you know, and people in leadership positions that have helped me along the way. You know? So with that said, um, I'll tell you that something that has helped me in terms of you know, what I can control. And that would be to, to always or to always consider getting outside of my comfort zone, right? So we can sometimes fall back into you know just wanting to do the same thing over and over again because that's what we're comfortable with and for me um i probably had my greatest advancement and probably most fulfilling assignments because i was willing to get outside of my comfort zone and do things that i'm not uh, that i wasn't comfortable with at the time and so you know specifically what happened with me uh, I initially, in the earlier part of my career, I was working in uh, geotechnical and environmental consulting. And when I was in my late 30s, I had an opportunity to make a career change um, to do business development for a specialty construction company. And that was Nicholson mm -hmm. Construction uh, here in Pittsburgh. And so I, I made that move, and it was a very uncomfortable move for me because I uh, had no experience with specialty, or I should say maybe I, I had a, a little, a very small amount of uh, experience with specialty geotechnical construction, and I had no experience with business development. And so I had an opportunity to make a wholesale career change, and I did it. And so I left a position and company that I was very comfortable with. And it ended up being just a really great move for me. I can tell you for at least the first year at Nicholson, I was a fish out of water. I was extremely uncomfortable, but I stuck it out and I persevered. And there's some great people there that uh, uh, helped me along the way with mentoring and bringing me up to speed with what the company does. So. I took a chance and it really, you know, paid off for me. And I've enjoyed a really nice career in business development since that point. But, you know, the overlying concept is whether it's business development or whether it's doing anything else that you're not accustomed to or comfortable with, you know, take the chance, put yourself out there. I, I typically don't turn down an assignment. So if I'm asked to do something, 
even if it's you know something that I'm not super comfortable with, I'll typically take it on for the challenge. I would just advise, you know, embrace the challenge. You'll get past the discomfort and it'll make you a better engineer or uh, professional. So wow. that would be my advice, Jared. Oh, that's great. That's great. Yeah. So um, those are some of the scariest moments. You don't really know how you're going to do it, but you said, yes, you got to figure it out. So that's great. Yeah. That's yeah. great. Well, Marty, thank you so much for coming on and thank you for sharing all the great insights with us. You share some great information and advice. I know it's going to be helpful for our listeners. Now, if someone is listening or watching and wants to reach out to you, what's the best way for them to reach you? You want to share an email address or, or you have social media? How can they find Marty? Sure. The best way to find me would be uh, either through LinkedIn. So I am LinkedIn. Feel free to connect if we're not connected already. Or I can give you my email address, which would be mtaube. That's M-T-A-U-B-E at menardusa.com. That's M-E-N-A-R-D-U-S-A.com. Excellent. All right. We'll make sure we get that in the show notes. Thank you so much for coming on. This is great. Thanks, Jared. Great talking to you. I hope you enjoyed the episode today. We would love to hear your feedback, comments, and or questions. Please feel free to go to geotechnicalengineeringpodcast.com where you'll find a summary of the key points discussed in today's episode, that being episode 53, as well as links to any of the resources, websites, or books mentioned during this episode. Until next time, we wish you the very best in all your geotechnical engineering endeavors. Peace.